Hello, I'm Fernando Guerra, Professor of Political Science and Chicano Studies at Loyola Marymount University. I'm also the director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. In addition, I am the host for the Urban Lecture Series, the program you are about to view. Here at Loyola Marymount University, we take pride in having our students engaged in the civic dialogue of Los Angeles. We send our students out to the community, but in addition, through this program, we bring the community to Loyola Marymount University. We hope you are informed by today's program. And for more information about Loyola Marymount University, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, and the Urban Lecture Series, please check out our website at lmu.edu backslash CSLA. Welcome to Loyola Marymount University, the Urban Lecture Series sponsored by the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. That is the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. It's also sponsored by the Chicano Studies Department, the Political Science Department, the American Cultures Department, the, uh, the uh, Geography, uh, Urban Studies Department, Sociology, uh, economics department as well. All these departments have come together to try to put this together for uh, uh, students and for our television audience. Um, today we're going to talk about immigration, uh, uh, new immigrants, uh, same as the old, and we've already seen a, uh, a presentation by Dr. Hayes Bautista. Dr. David Hayes Bautista is professor of medicine and director of the Center for the Study of Latino Health and Culture at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, I know it's somewhere around Los Angeles. I've never seen it, never heard of it, but I'm, I'm sure it's a, a good institution. Well, if, if I could add in, by the way, UCLA is the only campus at the University of California founded by a Latino, Reginaldo Francisco del Valle. So go figure. I had, I had no idea. I'll send you the paper uh -huh. on that. But uh, I, I'll, I will then have to do my uh, Loyola Marymount Latino uh, uh, issue, is that uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola is of Hispanic descent, number one. <laughs> <laughs> We all know that. And, and the very first building donated to uh, St. Vincent's College, which was the predecessor of Loyola and then Loyola Marymount University, in 1865, making it the first university in Los Angeles, was donated by Francisco Lugo. So uh, that's our deep Hispanic origins that we're trying to recapture now at Loyola Marymount <laughs> University. And the, and the founder of UCLA, by the way, went to St. Vincent's. So we actually share a common ancestry there. Uh, okay, here, there we go. <laughs> um, now, uh, next to uh, Dr. David Hayes Bautista is uh, Professor Nadia Kim. She is an assistant professor of uh, sociology here at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, next to her is uh, Mr. Efrain Jimenez. He is the Executive Projects Director of the Zacatecan Federation of <coughs> Southern California. And then uh, next to him is Dr. Leo Estrada. He's a Professor of Urban Planning, also at UCLA. And then finally we have Angelica Salas, who is Director of the Coalition of Human Humane Immigration Rights of Los Angeles, also known as his acronym CHURLA, is how we oftentimes refer to it. Um, David, uh, I know you've spoken already, but um, the, these numbers that we talk about in terms of Latino immigration, really what I think what the class is interested about quite a bit and is what impact does it have on Los Angeles? What does a demographic shift that we've seen where Latinos have gone from just 10% of the population in 1960 to 50% and probably more uh, today. What, how do we see that in the, in, 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 in the city? Clearly, we see a lot more brown faces. Clearly, much, you know, uh, communities such as Watts and Compton <coughs> and Inglewood, which we sometimes uh, identified as being African American. Now, all three of those are majority Latino. Uh, cities or communities. Uh, what are some of the other differences that you see? Well, interestingly, as, as we look at Watts, it used to be Rancho Tahuata, was originally Latino. Then it became, at around 1900, blue collar white. Then during World War II, it became blue collar African American. Now it's back to blue collar Latino. So it's just full circle. Um, but some of the interesting things we've seen. Uh, Latino immigrants, particularly during the 80s and 90s, basically kept Los Angeles from looking like Detroit. If you've ever been to Detroit, basically after both the white and black middle class left, there was nothing in Detroit. There's block after block after block of abandoned stores, factories, houses. I mean, there's nobody there. That's nobody there. Sorry, you get carried away with this stuff. <laughs> I love data. 
Uh, and, that would, and that happened to a lot of inner city America during the 1980s and 1990s, and it would have happened to Los Angeles, except for Latino immigrants, the only population willing to move in after the middle class black and white populations left. They kept the houses uh, on the tax rolls. They were producing uh, taxes, paying property taxes. Property values went up. In fact, when we had a uh, housing recession in the early 90s, the only places where housing values actually continued to rise, not Malibu, uh, it was South Central, Watts, et cetera, where Latino immigrants were moving in and actually willing to buy houses. So in many ways, actually, Latino immigrants have buoyed Los Angeles. Uh, well, um, they rehabbed all the housing stock basically with their own private capital. They didn't use federal money to do this. It was their own savings that did that. A tremendous gift, completely overlooked, and how did we reward them? We gave them Proposition 187. Nadia, when we think about the history of immigration in Los Angeles, it's not just a Latino story, although the Latino narrative tends to dominate, not just Latino, the Mexican narrative. Mm -hmm. And certainly we have Salvadorians, Guatemalans, Koreans, Armenians, you can go on and on. Uh, we often hear the, the data that uh, uh, Los Angeles is the second largest Mexican city. But it also happens to be the second largest uh, uh, Salvadorian city, the second largest Filipino city, the second largest Korean city, and we hear a lot of those things. How different is the immigration of other groups uh, than what we have just seen uh, explained to us? Um, about the Latino population? Yeah. Well, we know that the, you know, the biggest increases are among Latinos and Asian Americans. Asian Americans don't match Latinos, obviously, in number and percentage, but um, for the, compared to the national population of Asian Americans, you know, um, it's huge in LA. Um, California being um, the state with uh, the largest APA population. So, um, but I think what's interesting too about um, the, the changes is that the Asian American population is also um, becoming more ethnically diverse and um, and so in some ways it's interesting because it also makes for ethnic differentiation. You know, we talk a lot about racial differentiation um, between groups like Asians, Blacks, Latinos, and so on, and um, white Americans, but we don't always talk about ethnic differences and, and the way in which, you know, they become really focused on within a group, right? Um, there are hierarchies within and, um, you know, there are old conflicts from, you know, where they came from and things like that that I think manifest as well. Um, obviously, there's incredible language diversity among Asians. We don't, you know, unlike Latinos, we don't speak one language. Um, and so, you know, there's also the differentiation there, differentiation of culture and so on. Um, the interesting thing too, though, and, and this is also true of Latinos, is that um, although California, you know, has this, the largest um, APA population, um, you know, they're also going to the south and to the east. and so. Migration is changing um, nationwide, at, you know, in numbers that people didn't expect. So we tend to think of the South as very white and black, but it's also becoming quite Asian and Latino. Um, so I think, you know, we're sort of seeing shifts nationwide as well, not just within um, California. You wrote uh, Imperial Citizens, Koreans and Race from Seoul to L.A. What's that about? <laughs> In one minute or less, <laughs> okay. even though it took you uh, a three hundred page book in one minute. Okay. Um, okay, that's no. it. Thank you. Um, no. <laughs> Actually, I'm supposed to know the one line answer. So, if any of you guys write books, you need to have a one line answer about what it's about. Okay. So, it is about how immigrants learn about American race hierarchies and American racial. Um, I guess, messages before they even come to the United States because of um, globalization, different globalization processes. So one of the ones I look at is the United States, um, the United States, uh, I guess, you know, U.S. Um, dominance or U.S. Um, rule in other countries. So one of them is South Korea. I don't know if you're familiar that the United States has been in South Korea since 1945. Um, you guys have probably heard about North Korea, right? There's a lot in the news about North Korea. Um, well, that partly to do with the fact that the United States was one of the countries that divided the Koreas, that divided into North and South. Um, so that's one of the globalization processes, is US um, dominance abroad. Um, another one is um, culture. So the fact that now Hollywood movies cross borders, you know, reality shows cross borders, everything cross borders. So 
you know, you don't necessarily have to be in the United States to know, you know, images of different groups of color or images of white Americans. Um, now what's also happening because of globalization is there is increasing interconnection between the sending country and the country that they live in. Okay, they settle in as immigrants. So, you know, they can Skype each other, they can talk on the internet, they can travel to each other more quickly and more easily and, you know, trade stories about um, what happened in the LA riots in 1992. Um, what you should do um, if you're planning on setting up a business in or near Koreatown or South Central. So racial messages, um, racial hierarchies get communicated through these increasing connections between the sending and the receiving countries. That was not one line. No, it wasn't. And that was not so you're, one you're minute. Gonna to, you're going to have to work on your on your uh, on your on your one. I line failed of, miserably. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, it, one of the things that's interesting in terms of the Latino community now is you certainly see the ability of Latinos to completely live in Los Angeles in a Spanish uh, <coughs> uh, culture. We have La Opinion with uh, the largest Spanish language newspaper in America with a circulation of over 100,000 and probably a readership of a quarter million people. We have Univision and Telemundo with great news forecasts and of course these great telenovelas. Um, we have uh, the, the uh, top two radio stations in terms of the most listeners are both Spanish language uh, radio stations. So in Los Angeles, uh, you can live without speaking a word of English. And I think that's also true in terms of Korean, the Korean newspapers, Korean TV, Korean neighborhoods. Uh, you can um, n never uh, have to uh, speak English and you can do quite well in, in, in Los Angeles. Is that something new? Uh, or, or is that something that always existed in Asian uh, uh, communities? Within Los Angeles? Yeah. Uh, no, I think you, you know, I think back in the day you definitely had to learn some English because the communities weren't as big, the ethnic towns weren't as big. You didn't have like the Korean dramas. I don't know if you're familiar with the Korean wave. It, there's like all this pop culture now that's taken over Asia and, and other parts of the world and now seeping into the United States. I don't know if any of you heard of Rain. Have any of you heard of Rain, the pop singer, the Korean pop singer, <laughs> who was more popular than Stephen Colbert, and so Stephen Colbert was trying to always, you know, disrespect him basically and have competitions with him, and he imitated a Korean video and did like hip hop dancing and stuff. But anyways, um, they didn't have that, you know, and so um, I think now you could definitely live without learning the language, without leaving your ethnic networks, your church. But I think back in the day, you couldn't do that. I mean, you even had Rain perform at Staples Center, so you can. You even, know you can Rain, even, yeah, Fernando, oh my God. <laughs> a multicultural. Um, <laughs> you sing a song? No, no, no. It's like, so, um, <clears throat> what does it mean? Okay, this is uh, going to be. A, I'm going to ask it anyway. What does it mean to be Asian? I mean, what's Asian food? What's Asian culture? I know what Chinese food is. I know what Korean food is. <laughs> I know what the Korean language is. I know what Japanese. What's what's Asian? Fusion food. Fusion, like what? <laughs> Where they fuse the different cuisines. I think that in, make a, in it our ethnic. Yeah, in our last panel, someone was talking about a kosher burrito or something like that. So that was the the yeah. the, the, the basic idea. Well, they're fusing Mexican and Korean food now with the, you guys heard of the gogi truck? <laughs> Where people wait three hours for a freaking taco. Which, excuse me, but I just think that's amazing, you know. I think that was mentioned in our last panel. Yeah, so, so it's, yeah. it's catching yeah. on. Yeah. So um, let me switch over to Efrain. How do immigrants who just arrive, how do they survive? How do they, uh, um, uh, what are the mutual aid societies? Uh, Efrain Jimenez is executive project director of the Zacatecan Federation of Southern California. So first of all, we're going to ask him, what is the Zacatecan Federation of Southern California, and what is it that you do for them? Uh, okay, well, first of all, it, it is an honor for me to be sharing with uh, you all uh, what is it that we do. Uh, we are an umbrella organization that has 65 hometown associations. These hometown associations raise funds here in the United States to fund social uh, infrastructure projects back in Mexico, such as schools, hospitals, paving, electricity, potable water, all kinds of uh, social infrastructure that our government has not been able to provide in all, 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 in all of the uh, mo most remote places. Just to give you an idea, uh, for the last 10 years, we have, in, we have been able to invest more than 140 U.S. Uh, million dollars 
in more than 4,000 social infrastructure projects back in Mexico. All of this uh, under the 341 program, meaning that for every dollar we send to Mexico, that's only in my home state, not in Mexico as a, as a republic. For every dollar we send, our Mexican government would match it with three more, one of the local, one of the state level, and one of the central level. So uh, just to, uh, to make it, uh, the point more clear, every single year we are sending more than $5 million from the United States to be matched with another $15 million from the Zacatecan government. That's in my home state only. And that's not mentioning the, all the money that uh, um, Mexican immigrants uh, send back to Mexico, which is averaging over a billion dollars a month. That's, that's completely correct. These, uh, these kind of remittances that I'm talking about, that would be collective remittances. And uh, the way we raise those remittances is not because we get uh, donations from big uh, corporations or foundations. No, that is not the case. <coughs> this is a new way of philanthropy that people from uh, the ones that are picking up the oranges, the ones that are uh, washing the dish dishes, those are the ones uh, giving the money so that we can address the issue, the real issue in, on immigration, not politics. We are trying to address the causes of migrations, not the effects of it, as our politicians are doing it right here. We want people to stay there, to have the option to migrate, not the necessity to do it. So, well, because many people have said, well, if you raise this money, why don't you spend the money here in the communities that need it? And so, and what else do you, does your federation do for Zacatecans or Mexicans that are here in Los Angeles? Well. As we all know, all the uh, human uh, race, they get uh, together uh, around a common issue. And our common issue was to help our community back home first. Once we uh, got consolidated, that's the case of the Zacatecan Federation, then we were able to start working over here. What we do here, we, here, uh, we, do, uh, uh, we do give scholarships to, uh, to the students. We also have this, uh, we call it Plaza Comunitaria. We, we have uh, these uh, computers. Uh, we have like 20 computers. We ha uh, have internet classes, mathematics, Spanish, English, civic participation. We also have uh, health uh, classes. And uh, besides that, we are also promoting our culture here. We are trying to promote uh, integration. That is important to us to integrate. But it's very important for us not to forget our roots. Those uh, who doesn't know where they are coming from definitely would, not, would never know where they, where, where they are headed to. So definitely we are convinced that we need to uh, be proud of being a, an American, but at the same time uh, understand our language, our roots, our culture, everything. And uh, if you see uh, that next three persons to your left or to your right, right here, you see there is a lot of diversity here in Los Angeles. So that's why there is, there is where the really strength of Los Angeles relies on its diversity. I, I, I think, in my only point of view, that there is something wrong with us here in, in America as a whole. Because if, you, uh, if you've been in Europe, if you've been in Africa, uh, any young student, uh, 25 or older, would be able to speak at least four languages. And with us, we are in the middle of a, of a political battle whether to teach Spanish or English only. So what the heck? I mean, we are. Uh <laughs> well, don't, don't talk to these students, because I don't think we have a language requirement at, at LMU. And so they're, they're like happy with that. We're, we're fine with English, they're saying. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so um, just to remind everybody that we are here at Loyola Marymount University for the uh, 2010 Urban Lecture Series brought to you by the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. Next, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Leo Estrada, for, uh, professor of urban planning at, at UCLA. Uh, he is one of the utmost experts on uh, demographics, uh, but he's also uh, active in other areas. And one of the things that I want to talk to him about is his current association with the AARP that I've recently joined. Um, uh, um, <laughs> They kept lowering the age. It wasn't that I was getting older. It was just they, they wanted more members, so they kept lowering the age. Um, and, and one of the uh, constant themes is certainly in the presentation that you just saw by Dr. David Hayes Bautista is how young the population is. But also there are old Latinos, um, like some of us at this panel. 
and we have certain uh, needs and there are uh, certain organizations. And so I, I know that, that you've been involved with that. And also, uh, uh, Professor Estrada was uh, at one point uh, um, a, a, a appointee to become the director of the census, although he ultimately decided not to take that job. Uh, um, that he was going to be the one that was in charge of counting everybody at one point. And we are about to do that process. I think next month, things will be mailed to every single household in America. So every single one of you will be receiving a form that asks all kinds of questions about uh, you, uh, demographics. Uh, and uh, uh, Professor uh, Estrada was going to be in charge of all of that until he wised up and thought it might be a better idea to stay <laughs> in LA than be in Washington, DC. So talk to us about the AARP and Latinos. Talk to us about the census that is going to come up. And talk to us about what you've heard these others. So uh, Professor Leo Estrada. Well, um, I'll be real brief. Actually, I, I want David to speak a little bit about the, the relationship between young and old, because he's done some work on this. And I think it's, he's as, as uh, adequate as anyone to, to bring this forth to you. The, we've talked a lot about growth, but as an urban planner, and because we're kind of more spatially oriented, I'm actually also interested in clustering. So we do have growth in populations, but what is of interest to planning is the clustering. That is, um, why do some groups cluster more than others? For example, the Japanese do not cluster. Uh, the Chinese cluster more than the uh, Koreans, but the Vietnamese cluster more than anybody else. Why is it? Um, why is some people from Guatemala are more likely to cluster than people from other areas of, so of is, Honduras? So what is the definition of clustering? Just living that next to each other? Living tightly together. And so what happens is that uh, Zacatecans will often live in the same apartment building. Uh, and they'll often live within a few miles of each other. And what makes hometown associations possible is the fact that they create networks and they find ways to come together. And that can't happen if one's in Pasadena, one's in Long Beach, and one is West LA. They, they cluster. And so one of the interesting things about immigration to see is how the clustering happens and what it <coughs> implies for a city. So we've, if you look at the picture right now, we have some very highly segregated areas, mostly Latino, uh, but we also have Asian areas that are clustering, clustered. And then we have some newer things we've never saw before, like middle class clustering. So it's not just you know lower class or low income. Uh, there are places like Roland Heights and, and Murray Park and places where there's clustering of middle class Asians. And we see the same thing of Latinos in places like Diamond Bar and Chino. So what happens is that immigration has this really interesting role in that when it comes to the United States, it doesn't just s spread it out, it clusters. And if it doesn't cluster here, it clusters somewhere else. While immigration doesn't mean a lot in California, in Arkansas, in North Carolina, in Mississippi, in Alabama, in Georgia, immigration matters. And it's the, almost entirely due to the <coughs> growth of immigration in those areas. So there are differences in regions. So the first of all is that there are, you have to keep in mind that it has real impacts on what a city looks like and what it feels like. And so um, the more important thing probably for Los Angeles, which isn't true in all, all areas, is that the boundaries are very permeable. So it isn't unusual to get up if you wanted to and you could go have dim sum in the morning in Chinatown and then go to East LA and have a taco, then go to Long Beach and have some Cambodian food, come up in West Los Angeles and end up in a you know Cantor's deli eating Jewish food. You can do that in Los Angeles. Nothing per keeps you from doing that. There are other places where the boundaries are a little bit more harder, and people don't go into others, other territories. But LA is very interesting because we know where these things are, and we know that they exist, and you can actually have access to most of it, or whatever it is that you're willing to experiment. In terms of aging, uh, Latinos, we don't have very many older people yet in the population. But there, there are the immigrants. They're the ones that we saw in the chart are the, uh, those who arrived earlier. And <clears throat> they came at a time when either you kind of sank or swam. And so some were able to do well educationally and occupationally and so forth, but a good number didn't. And so what we have is a lot of people who spent their time as home, care, you know, home caretakers of the children not working or men who worked at low-skilled jobs, uh, not necessarily with a pension. And so today what we have is an elderly population that is small, but needy. Uh, they're, the least, they're the ones who are least English proficient. They're the ones who are, have the lowest educational attainment. And they are individuals who, in our society, also don't have access to things. 
So they're not eligible for Social Security uh, necessarily. They're not eligible for pensions. They're not eligible for Medi-Cal in many cases because they are undocumented. So what happens is that it's a, it's a population that often gets ignored because it's small and it really has implications. The same thing is true of other groups. Let me just mention that um, among Asian groups, uh, their proportions of foreign born are very high, 60, 70, 80 percent. Um, there are a lot of Cambodians and Vietnamese who do not speak a word of English at all. And they've been here now for 20 years. Uh, same thing we saw with, Latin, with Mexicans who arrived back in the 40s and 50s. And so what happens is that the process of, of acclimating and changing and becoming part of the society still goes on, but it's been decelerating. It's been the, the, the time it takes to kind of go from arriving you know, off the boat, although we don't really come on a boat, uh, to becoming someone who can function really successfully in the, in the mainstream takes longer to get there, partly because of our ethnic clusters that can protect you for longer, and secondly, because the opportunity base of getting out and doing things is less than it used to be. So the most important thing is just not to think about it as people kind of in a, you know, you know, up there in a space. This is about what's going on at, you know, in a neighborhood. And so wherever you live, you probably live in a cluster, because whites cluster too, like in Malibu. Uh, so what happens is that you get, you, as you begin to look around, you say, why do people cluster? And you say, well, housing prices matter, you know, what you can afford, where you afford to live, where you work, lots of things come into play. But the reality is that if you look at Los Angeles, you don't see people spread out evenly. There's clustering that happens, and the clusters meet each other. And sometimes where the African American and Latino you know, edges rub, or where the Asian and white edges rub, you get tensions. Because these are two very different, different clusters sort of meeting together, and then sort of you know, trying to deal with one another. Um, the census, explain to the students uh, what's going to happen in <coughs> March and April. And, and what that process is, and just the, the overwhelming uh, uh, task that it is. Yeah. In 1980, I was one of the managers of the census, which is one of the reasons why they asked me to try to come back again. But one of the things that happens, you have, cannot even imagine the enormity of this. It's, it's so huge. And I'll just give you an example. This is 1980, that I was signing invoices for 7,000 pencils and 35,000 desks and uh, you know, a, a roll of paper that cost uh, $65,000 and was going to be flown in from Germany. The, the enormity of this is huge. In, in, in the week of uh, March 15th, not every person but every address is going to get a form asking them to fill it out for the 2010 census. And you'll basically be given about a, about a month to fill out the form and send it in. And the form only asks eight questions. That's it, eight questions. And uh, those eight questions are about your age, sex, uh, race and ethnicity, whether you own or rent a house, and then the relationship you have to the other people in the household. That's it. It's a very short form, and everybody gets this form, every address. If you do not respond, then they're going to come to your house starting in about June and start asking, um, in May, and start asking for that information. And then if you don't respond by then because they can't find you, they keep trying, and they'll keep trying until approximately July. And then after July, they will um, impute who you are by asking your neighbors. And they'll ask your neighbors who lives there, how many people are there. And they can't get all the information. Well, they'll get enough to get some basic information. And the idea is to get the information for every household in America. And uh, there's always an undercount. There's always people not counted. And among the worst are you guys, uh, youth. Uh, you're supposed to be counted. If you're living in the dorm, the, your residents, RAs, are supposed to count you. And uh, if you're kind of living at home sometimes and in a dorm sometimes, you're living with your girlfriend sometimes, you're living with a friend sometimes, those are the people who get missed because nobody knows exactly who. Should we count him here? Or should make, maybe they'll count him there. Those kind of people that are moving around constantly get missed. And then some people are hiding. Some people don't want to get caught or seen by the government. And so uh, some are trying to avoid you know, child care payments. And some are trying to avoid uh, because they don't have papers and whatever. All these individuals that are out there are important. And I'm going to give you two reasons real quick to finish up this, this discussion. The first is that. The census matters because the government gets reapportioned by it. And we are at a situation where California could actually lose a congressional seat because our margin right now, whether we get it or not, is about 167,000 people. So if we count up 167,000 less than we think we're, we should, then we're going to lose a congressional seat. That's how close it is for us. And, but the whole United States gets restructured. Politics gets restructured by redistricting and reapportionment. 
in the year 2011, and it's something only America does. We don't have fixed boundaries. We shift them, we change them at, at the, every 10 years, and it's a restructuring <laughs> of political space. And I'll let Fernando deal with that because that's one of the things he does. But that's number one. Number two, about $400 billion is given out based on population. Now repeat that number. $400 billion. So in, whether it's transportation, hospitals, public works, uh, education, it gets proportioned according to population. So they'll say, how many kids are there? How many elementary school kids? Well, that's how much money that state gets, 400 billion. And then finally, the last thing is, it's how we find out who we are. Now, there's another process ongoing at the same time, I don't want to get into, but it collects <coughs> more information, and it's get link, it gets linked to the data that we get from the census we're taking, and that will tell us a lot about who we are, how we're changing, are we improving, are we getting better, are we getting smarter, better educated, poor, uh, more homeowners, what, what did the foreclosures do to us? All of that will come from the census. And so it becomes the way we touch ourselves in terms of who we are in the United States in a very important way. Then finally to finish up about the census, is the last thing to say about it, is that it is, um, it is something that happens every 10 years by constitution. That is, we started a country, and one of the interesting things about the United States is that we started our system, it didn't exist anywhere else. We were filled with kings and queens and monarchies and tribal areas and feudal lords. And the United States, when it got formed, decided to do something called the Republic. In fact, it's uh, referred to in some of the Federalist Papers, the Great Experiment. And everybody agreed we should have a president that was weak, not a strong one like a king. So we put checks and balances on, the king, on uh, our president. Then we took the Senate, and that was easy. We decided to divide two, every state got two. At that time, 13 states, we got, each one got two senators. But the House was going to be uh, developed by <coughs> representation. And the only way you could do that was to take a census. So since 1790, we've been doing it every 10 years. And it's part of America's culture, politics, and even structure. We wouldn't be here as America if we had never taken a census. And so it's part of a historical process that you should be aware of, not something that somebody invented recently, but was at the very beginning of our country. How much is it going to cost to undertake the census in 2010? A lot. Um, <laughs> that sounds like one of my midterm answers from one of the students when yeah. I asked that is like a, a lot. It's going to a little the, bit more precise. The cost for the year 2010 is going to be a little bit over 500 mi uh, million dollars, but it doesn't count everything else that went before, like all that paper and all the things we have done last three four years. The total cost is a little bit of like 1.4 billion dollars, just to count people. Just to count people. So. Uh, again, we're here at Loyola Marymount University, the 2010 Urban Lecture Series brought to you by the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. I'd like to next turn to Angelica Salas, Director of the Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles, or, or CHIRLA. W what is CHIRLA? What, what is it that you guys do? Um, so CHIRLA is an organization um, that was founded in 1986 uh, with the passage of the Immigration Reform and Control Act. Uh, which actually um, was the first time that our government did um, uh, two things. First and foremost, it actually created um, sanctions uh, for any employer who hired the undocumented. And uh, what it also did is it provided um, amnesty uh, for 2.7 million individuals. Um, so our organization started um, during that time. Its purpose, um, while it's changed over time, remains very first grounded in um, engaging immigrants themselves um, in organizing immigrants who are low-wage workers, um, educating them about their rights in the labor, um, in their labor rights, but many other rights, and also their responsibilities. Um, we organize um, day laborers, household workers, street vendors, and actually our strongest base is immigrant students um, across uh, LA County in high schools. We're in 10 different high schools throughout Los Angeles, and actually in La this month in 39 college campuses across the state of California. Um, and part of the reason we do this is because we feel it's so important um, that as we move forward our agenda, immigrants are uh, engaged and part of, uh, of movement forward. The other aspect of our, of our work, in addition to the community education and organizing, is also policy advocacy. So we advocate uh, for uh, laws that protect the rights, both the human and the civil rights of immigrants, at a local level 
So um, at a city, uh, LA city level, but also LA county level, at a state level, and also at a national level, because many of our immigration policies actually are not, um, the jurisdiction is not at a, uh, at LA <coughs> or in the state of California, um, but they are actually laws that have to be determined by Congress. Talk a little bit about the in-state tuition for undocumented immigrant students and then also the DREAM Act. Sure. Um, so you saw uh, the demographics and um, one of the things that uh, when we're talking about how many uh, young people are or when you looked at uh, the numbers in terms of uh, young people who are the children of immigrants or uh, immigrants themselves, sometimes we always assume that they're adults, but in fact they're young, uh, many of them are young people here in, um, in California. Uh, we believe it's about, um, if I'm not, maybe I hear we have demogra the, the demographics, if anybody can provide this particular uh, information, but um, here at least in Los Angeles County, Marta, we believe that every year about 10,000 young people who graduate are undocumented. In this LA County, we have about 63% of young people whose parents are immigrants. And so it's, uh, I, would, I just want to say that it's, uh, it's a very important um, population. But the other thing about it is that uh, we work with young people um, who came here with their parents without legal status, um, who have grown up here, who arrived when they were uh, two years old, three years old, four years old, maybe a little older, um, and who basically have known um, this city or this state as their home. And suddenly, sometime in high school, they realize um, that in order to get to many of the universities, like Loyola, Marymount, um, they need a social security number. And without a social security number, um, they don't have access to uh, financial aid. And prior to 2001, they didn't have access to in-state tuition. And what that meant was that many young people who were incredibly um, motivated, who are, were very, very talented, couldn't um, go on to school. And so, um, partially because they were also the sons and daughters of household workers, day laborers, who um, earned probably less than what the tuition cost for in the in-state tuition. So, 2001, a law was passed, um, uh, AB 540, that provides um, immigrant students who can demonstrate um, that they've actually been in um, in in the. Uh, in this, have gone on to high school and can show that they've been here a year and a day that, uh, that they can actually get in-state tuition. However, they still cannot get financial aid. So while they can get in-state tuition, they don't have financial aid. So for um, colleges like Loyola Marymount, it means that um, it's very unlikely that they'll be able to enter um, these colleges because they're not public universities, they're private universities where the uh, um, I would say just a, the, the tuition is so high. So that's what AB 540 and the DREAM Act, what it does, it seeks to um, legalize the status of these young people who can actually demonstrate that they've been in college um, or in, in high schools for three years. Um, and once they graduate from that high school that they go on to college or that they go on to the military um, and that then after that process they could actually get um, their legal status in this country and then eventually have access to financial aid. So how old were you when you came to the U.S.? I came here when I was, um, I would say between four and five. And did your parents ask you, did you want to come? No, my parents came first and uh, then they, they brought me and I'm very thankful that they did because it made all the difference in the world for me. So the idea of this, uh, this advocacy is that there are many individuals are put in a position where they had no choice. I mean, like most small children have no choice. If their parents come, they have to come along with them and then they find themselves in this situation. Yeah, and I, I think that definitely they didn't have a choice in the matter, um, but I also think that their parents, what they were trying to do is actually give them a, a different kind of life. Um, because for many of these young people um, and for their parents, it, it would have meant um, not having a roof over their head, not having food to eat, and definitely, very, very definitely, not, probably not having an education. Um, so they didn't have uh, a choice in the matter, but I think most, and because we work with so many young people, most young people are very um, thankful to their parents that they actually did that. So David, um, immigrant and immigration, this is not going to be an immigration debate because most of the people here on this panel are very pro-immigrant, and I didn't want to create the whole debate uh, uh, type of atmosphere. I wanted to, you know, who are we? How did, how did we get here? Um, but immigration is also very much a political issue. And 
how do you see, why does it always have this cycle of becoming a, a uh, scapegoating immigrants, especially in times of recessions? Though, would you say, even though we've had this great recession, that immigrants have been uh, uh, scapegoated less in this recession than in previous recessions? Well, actually, it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> I've just finished creating a demographic model of Latinos in California from 1769 to 2008. And one of the things that's interesting is that there haven't been just one or two waves of immigration from Mexico in that period. There have been eight waves of immigration from Mexico, beginning 1769. But what's interesting is, after 1850, suddenly California is part of the United States, so that the waves that arrived got a different treatment. And when this is part of Mexico, hey, you're just moving from one part of Mexico to the other. Suddenly, 1850, the ones who had been here before were suddenly U.S. citizens. Just a couple of weeks later, Sam Brannan stands on a street corner in San Francisco, waves a little glass bottle and says, gold, and you had the gold rush. Well, you had a huge wave of immigration from Mexico, Central, and South America during the gold rush. And in fact, they knew how to dig for gold because they've been doing gold and silver mining in Mexico and in Ecuador and Peru for hundreds of years. You had a royal college of mining. So when the other 49ers got out here, they saw all these Latinos busily digging up gold, and they said, this is unfair. They know how to do this. So they passed the first law in California was the foreign miners tax. And whom did they tax? Latino miners. By the way, how much did they tax? $20 a month. Now the average wage during the gold rush for an average person was a dollar a day. Basically taxing everything you could expect to earn, then you could keep the rest. The idea was to drive them out of the gold fields. It didn't work, by the way. They just went to the next gold field where their taxes weren't collected. You had the uh, land acts that basically challenged the legal rights of the Latinos' own land to keep the land, and most of them wound up losing their land. Uh, while the U.S. government allowed squatters to sit, they got prima facie, so if you had squatted, and if eventually actually a land, act, uh, a land title was approved, then the landowner had to pay you for all the improvements you had made. Uh, then we had the rise of the Know Nothing Party right before the Civil War, extremely virulently anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic. In fact, one of their one of their platforms is that no Catholic could ever hold public office in the United States, plus very anti-Spanish language, and they wanted to strip the Californios, all the Latinos had become U.S. citizens because the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo from U.S. citizenship. So I'd have to say, no, we've seen this before, plus the lynchings, let's not even go into the lynchings. Uh, and the lynching, when the lynch mob came around, they didn't ask, oh, by the way, are you a California U.S. citizen? Oh, we're not going to lynch you. Are you from El Salvador? Oh, we're not going to lynch you. No, didn't matter. Equal opportunity lynching if you were Latino. Um, so we, we saw that. And we've seen it consistently. In fact, every time there's been a wave of immigration, and there, since 1850, when U.S. Uh, California became a, a state, till now, there have been six waves of immigration as part of the United States. After about the height of every wave, you start to see this reaction time and time and time again. At least now, they're not lynching us. Okay, that, that, that's some improvement. Now, interestingly, within all of that, ever since 1790, the average Latino in California has been born in California. Immigrants have always been a minority of the total Latino population. Sometimes a really small minority, sometimes a large minority, but always a minority. The average Latino has been born here, and you wouldn't know that to listen to popular public debate because it's been so focused on just the immigrant and then the illegal immigrant on top of that. They're all conflated. People say illegal, they say immigrant, they mean Latino. They don't make any distinction. They didn't do that during the gold rush either. So, um, Angelica, you, we see oftentimes a anti-Latino, anti-immigrant <coughs> emerge for a variety of different reasons, not, not looking at what the causes are, but what has been the reaction by the Latino community and what has Churla been doing in terms of organizing to, uh, um, to battle this uh, an anti-immigrant uh, um, hysteria that you see sometimes? Well, I, I think that if our policy was actually based on fact, we'd have very different types of laws, but it actually is um, many of our, um, much of our policy on immigration is based on fallacy and many times on myth that then uh, sort of moves forward as, as if that's the reality. So then what we have is um, a lot of, from our perspective, backwards laws, both at a local, state, and national level. And in many of these, it's um, a perception, first and foremost, that most um, of people who are Latino are immigrants and that most people who are immigrants are undocumented. So when you actually asked individuals, you know, how many people um, in the United States are actually immigrant, the kind of percentages that they give are huge. 
where they say, oh, you know, it's like 60% of the United States is, is uh, immigrant. Um, when, they, when you ask them, um, and when the fact right now is it's only about 11%, when you ask them out of that population, um, how many are actually um, undocumented out of the immigrant population that we have, and right away, people will go into these very high percentages because that's sort of their perception. When out of 11% um, of our population, which is about, you know, uh, 30, it's about 33, 30 um, a million immigrants, only 30% or a little bit above 30% are actually undocumented. So we have 30, um, I would say it's a, a third, a third, a third. A third are undocumented, a third are legally in the country because the diff diverse statuses in terms of um, different visas and different all. visas, legal permanent <coughs> residence, et cetera. And then the rest are naturalized citizens. But if, if, you would, if you would actually review what the law is around immigration, you think that everything is about the undocumented. And then the way that that actually connects with Latinos is that then there is a, um, a rights that are negated, not just uh, for for immigrants, but for all Latinos, and um, discrimination of many individuals based on the fact of this assumption of illegality in this in this country. Um, so that when we were talking about, well, when you said, you know, well, maybe they're not lynching us in certain places in the South and and in and I would say in the East Coast, where we've had actually people who have been beat, um, who were perceived to be undocumented, who were perceived um, to be in this country without legal status, and that. That is a reality. So what are we doing about it? Well, there's, um, the first thing I think is very important is to really put out what the reality is. Um, I think that we understand that um, many times policy is both made from the head, which is you know the facts and the figures, but a lot of it is also from the heart, which is people's emotional state. Um, and so to really engage both immigrants and non-immigrants in understanding better the reality. The other um, uh, aspect of our work is also to promote uh, policy that will actually advance those rights. So right now, CHIRLA um, is part of the national campaign to reform immigration um, laws in, in America um, to actually um, move forward comprehensive immigration reform that will um, both deal with the individuals who are here without legal status, who are adults, who are young people, um, so that there can be um, what I would, from our, uh, you know, our perception, you know, we bring people out of the shadows, who people who can fully integrate into this society, um, who can contribute even more than they're contributing. Um, just recently, the University of Southern California um, did a study. What, it, what would it mean if we were actually um, to legalize um, the undocumented migrants here in California? We have the largest population. It would be an immediate boost, and these are conservative numbers, of $16 billion to the, econ to the California economy. So to <coughs> motivate um, legislation that would actually um, allow individuals to further contribute to, um, uh, to, their, to their state and certainly to this nation. But it also um, is talk, uh, the movement for immigration reform is also about um, talking about why are we in this situation in the first place. So really, let's come to a reality check as a nation uh, in terms of our need for labor. And let's do it in a way that both protects native-born workers, but also protects migrant workers um, who, um, let me, let, let's just say wh the, when they arrive here, there's a job for them. Um, let me just go down the line with Leo, Efren, and Nadia. What's the likelihood of immigration reform happening? And if it does happen, what do you think would be some of the a aspects? <coughs> I'm <coughs> pretty pessimistic at the moment, but let me tell you a story as to why. Um, over the last four months, I've been in Washington, D.C. almost every month working on health care reform, uh, a bill that right now is kind of still me. And I'll start off with a story that was in Los Angeles Times yesterday indicating that <clears throat> as part of the budget crisis we're having in California, that there's the thought of, of no longer making new legal immigrants <coughs> eligible for Medi-Cal. That means that those who already have it are fine, but those that do not have it uh, will have to be um, you know, can no, can no longer be on Medi-Cal. <coughs> in Washington, D.C., <coughs> okay. in Washington, D.C., during the health care bill, one of the things that was fascinating to me was how the bill, before the bill could come out of the House, it was important and essential on the part of the Democratic majority to make sure that there were very strong statements in the bill restricting undocumented illegal aliens from participating or having health care. 
and it was brought by what they call Blue Dog Democrats, but it had full support, and in the end, Nancy Pelosi told people, I can't pass the bill without those restrictions. Well, in some ways that's kind of not, it, it's believable. It's believable because we stigmatized, you know, that population of undocumented so much in the United States that it was an easy thing to do, and politicians, no one, no, no one runs for office on behalf of immigrants. They run against undocumented, and so it, that was what it was gonna take to come out of the House. But the House had two other things in it that sometimes people forget. The first was that it said that if you're a legal immigrant, now we're not talking about undocumented work, legal immigrant, you would not be eligible for any of the programs for five years. You had a five-year waiting period. And secondly, if there was an exchange, which was the idea of universal care, everybody has a place to go buy insurance, legal immigrants could not buy exchange, could not buy insurance to do the exchange. I mean, we're not <coughs> talking undocumented anymore. I think what happened was we broke through a moral barrier where we used to make this distinction that those undocumented or illegals are somebody we don't want to deal with. But we're talking about legal immigrants. We're talking about people with papers who are legal residents, who pay taxes, who work here, et cetera. Well, what happened after that is that the whole concept, it became a joke to talk about universal health care because there are 47 million people without insurance, but the best of the bills, no matter what, covered about 31 million. Well, the ones who are not being covered, of course, were the people who are legal and illegal immigrants. So what happened then is it went to the Senate. Well, the Senate bill actually had the same five-year waiting period, but it did not, it did allow people to buy in the exchange. And that's because their bill didn't reduce the deficit as much, so they needed more income, and that's how they did it. But what I want to do is just very think, make you think about this, that we are now passing national legislation on health care in the United States, and we are putting into law the idea that legal immigrants are just as bad somehow as those other people that other people don't like. And for Asian populations, this is huge. They, most of their population are legal immigrants, not illegal. And so it impacts on them even more as a group, although for Latinos the numbers would be the largest. So the fact we no longer make this distinction that illegal now and legal are bunched together and, and put in a, in a place where they no longer have rights just reminds us of how far down we have come. Uh, really, you know, this, this goes beyond the issue of human rights. Um, and you gotta ask yourself, why do we do this? And I'm just gonna be real quick. I think some of it's because we're scared. I think there are people out there who are just scared of what immigration represents to America in the future and the changes that are happening. I think I mean, we do it well, because... Why are people scared? Because the whole history of the United States is immigration. That's the, the myth and all that. It's, uh, you know, that we're the great immigrant nation. But the immigrants that came, 80% of immigrants who came before 1960 were from Europe. 80% of the immigrants who come today are from Asia and Latin America. That's the difference. Efrain, I want to remind the students that if you have a question to ask, if you might want to uh, make your way over and line up over, the, uh, over there by the, yeah. the mic. Okay, so okay. Let, me, let me finish. Yeah. Two. Yes, One of the reasons is because we, we, some people are scared. <laughs> the second is because some people are now defining it as the enemy. And I think it's really important to realize that in a time of terrorism and issues about insecurity, immigrants are being seen as something to be feared uh, in terms of security issues. And finally is the issue of they cost too much. And I had just talked about the fact that that's a myth, but the idea that they cost too much continues to be the main thing people point to. They cost us too much, we can't afford it. And the result is that we now have these situations where we basically have given people, we've never had the right to housing in the United States. We never had the right to health. We've never had the right to go to college. And now we don't, we're not gonna give people the right to be you know, healthy. And so I think what's important here is to just realize that we're in a very different point we've been before because it's not just a few loud mouths somewhere who are angry and mad. This is the U.S. Congress who's acting in this way. Efrain, immigration reform, what do you think the likelihood is? Well, what I've seen is that uh, it's been politically accepted to go against the Latino community. So what, what I've seen is that uh, the main problem that we have that is that there is disinformation. We need to, to have the facts uh, not many people is talking about how much we as Latinos are contributing to the GDP of the United States, almost 7 percent. And, uh, and all of this, uh, I don't recall the, the name of the, uh, of, of, the, of the agency of the United States 
who, who is the one that is certifying this. Uh, no one is talking about the cost of migration for the sending countries. For example, in Mexico, the trends of migration before they used to be only laborers. But if you see on the trends, and, and I am not an expert, but if you do a little bit of research, you will see that there is a lot of professionals coming here to work here at the United States. And uh, for every uh, billion dollars we send, we are contributing almost double, according to these studies, to the GDP in the United States. So th that would be some information that we need to bring to the public, because uh, there is uh, this extreme right uh, on the United States that is uh, always attacking the, the immigrants. And that doesn't matter if it's from Latin America, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's more strong, the attacks to the Latin American people, but uh, actually to the, uh, to the whole immigrants. So just to, to end my participation at this point, we are uh, definitely uh, convinced that we need to inform our, our people. We need to teach them English. That's the first thing. The second one is we need to provide them the means to, to teach them financial education. That was, that's what we are doing here at Zacatecan Federation. But best of all, we need to bring our people to start on the civic participation. We need to send a message to our politicians, to our leaders, that we count, that we need to, uh, uh, to do a lot, but definitely we need to send them the message with this civic participation. And that would be for the Latino community, but also to all the young people, because most of the young people, they don't go to vote. So we need to send the, the message. So th actually, that's what we are promoting from uh, uh, our perspective at the Zacatecan Federation. And at the national level, we are joining forces with some other uh, 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 Latinos, uh, Latino organizations, not only from uh, Zacatecas, from Mexico, from El Salvador, but from some other uh, places and uh, from uh, some other continents as well. Um, Nadia, immigration reform? And then again, remind the students if you have a question, come on up either right here at this end or that end. Okay? Okay. Um, she's been standing. Oh, why don't oh, you go ahead and finish, okay, then we'll okay, get right to all it. All right. Um, okay, immigration reform. Um, yeah, you know, similar to what um, Leo Strada was saying, I, I think one of the biggest indicators of the slowness of reform or even avoiding reform altogether was that in the presidential election, you barely heard it come up. I think they were not talking about immigration reform. The candidates, you know, on both sides wanted to avoid the issue because, you know, there's so many explosive, um, you know, sort of debates about immigration, you know, starting with the driver's licenses. Should we give driver's licenses to undocumented immigrants? You know, they're hemming and hawing. They don't know how to answer. They're flip-flopping. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, you, you talk to a mainstream American audience who doesn't <coughs> understand what, you know, immigration, um, what it does for our country in a positive way, what it does for our economy, you know, how our uh, nation is rooted in immigration, um, you know, they buy into all the stereotypes, oh, crime goes up among immigrants, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, if they don't know that, then if you tell the average person, you're going to give an undocumented person a driver's license, I mean, to them it just seems unthinkable. But if you actually look at the data and, and you, you know, do analysis, well, it would save us so much money in insurance costs. It allows people to be more productive and work at their jobs. You know, I, there's so many benefits um, to allowing people to live and work um, in the United States and contribute to the country. So, you know, the fact that it didn't even come up, Obama's not even touching it right now. I don't, you know, it's, I, I know a lot of people are frustrated with the Obama administration that actually work on immigration issues and want to work on immigration reform. He, he promised in the first 100 days that he would introduce. Yeah, what has he done, uh, you know, with, for immigration reform, right? And, and this is, you know, partly it's because of the economy, okay? So that makes sense. You need to focus on the economy. He's focusing on health care reform. Um, but I think there's an avoidance going on as he, well. He is the first president who is the son of an immigrant. Right, directly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, an immigrant of color. So, yeah, I forgot. He's also <laughs> black. I forgot about that. <laughs> no, no, no. But the oh, other no, thing no, I no. wanted to say about this um, is that um, the grassroots mobilization, I think, is, is, gives me hope. Okay, I mean, think about in 2006, we had a million people on the streets of Los Angeles. This was a multi ethnic, multiracial coalition. You know, it was painted as all Latinos, but there were, you know, Asian immigrant groups there, there were Arab groups there, there were, you know, African groups, Caribbean. I mean, there, it was a very multi ethnic, multiracial um, 
mobilization. It's, you know, you, you know, you guys hold events. It's not easy getting five people at events, you know, so getting a million people out, you know, to reform immigration, it's a really big deal. Um, so, so the lack of hope is also that despite that there's all this sort of grassroots community, you know, um, on the ground mobilization, you're still not seeing a response from the top down. But that doesn't mean that um, I and others don't have hope because you're actually seeing mobilization um, intensify. And, you know, um, right now I'm also um, studying um, immigrant communities, Latino and Asian American, <laughs> how um, in these communities they're organizing around clean air and, you know, making sure their children with asthma get treated and get proper health care. Um, you know, they're fighting the ports, they're fighting the companies that are just, you know, blowing all this pollution. Um, you know, around their schools and homes. So you're seeing women, low-income, undocumented immigrant women spearheading these campaigns. And so there is hope at the grassroots level, what Cheerla's doing, all these other organizations. I think the level of collective mobilization's definitely gone up. Okay. Uh, we're here at Loyola Marymount University, the 2010 Urban Lecture Series, brought to you by the Levy Center. And we got our first question. Good evening, my name is George. I'm a senior, returning senior, and they did, they did lower the age on us, Dr. Guerra. I mean, yeah, they did. I thought you were supposed to be 80. This is, this is what happens if you get a bunch of incompletes. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Guerra. <laughs> For 30 years, I was in denial, but I'm not anymore. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, boy. Um, one of the things in my experience is. I know what it's like to be vilified, uh, not being allowed to swim in Southgate Pool. Go figure that one out. I remember those and, days, yeah, the colored okay. days versus the white days. Okay. And then back in the day, when I was here, back in the late 70s, the question would have been, and nobody's asking this question, but the question would have been, why don't we just call it for what it is, for what this rhetoric is? It's political, I mean, it's racist obfuscation. We got to find somebody to blame. And they're scared of us. What? I don't know why they're afraid of us, but why don't we just call it what it is? <coughs> Racial obfuscation. That was my question. Uh, why are they afraid of us? Can I, can I respond? And who is us? Okay. Well, it's interesting. Um, up until 1850, LA was a Latino town. It was just simply Los Angeles. Everybody spoke Spanish. Out came the gold rush, a bunch of folks came out from the Midwest and, oh my God, there are all these foreigners here, and they're speaking a foreign language, Spanish. And then, well, actually, a lot of the 49ers learned Spanish. Kit Carson was bilingual. He learned Spanish as an adult. His wife is a Jaramillo from New, York, uh, New Mexico. Actually, an amazing number. Cowboys all learn Spanish. That's why we have rodeos and everything else. Then, the Transcontinental Railroad got put in. A whole bunch of folks came out of the Midwest, oh my God, all these foreigners out here in California, and they're speaking a foreign language. A lot of them learn Spanish too. And it keeps going again and again. Every time you get a new, and it happened when I was a kid, uh, when all the uh, folks came out after World War II, uh, moved out to California, all these foreigners here in Los Angeles speaking a foreign language. And you know what their grandkids are learning? They're marrying Latinos and everything else. So I think it has to do with folks on the East Coast think that somehow that we're supposed to be the Atlantic Coast. We're the American West. And in the American West, actually, one of the host cultures is Latino. We've been here for 400 years. Not a problem. Hey, we'll marry anybody. That's not a problem either. <laughs> anybody else in terms of, I mean, this scapegoating that happens? I just, I also just wanted to add, you know, it was Chinese as well, right? I mean, the idea, the foreigner, the foreigner miners tax, the foreign language, um, the idea of a takeover, which then led to the exclusion laws against um, the Ch later all Asians. So I think it's important to talk. About. And I think it's important also to say that there is a very organized group of individuals and organizations that are very well funded and who who are very much supported, who actually promote a lot of this. Uh, 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 this agenda um, that are that have professional lobbyists in Congress um, that have uh, a lot of influence. So it's not just sort of. I, I want to say I think that there is a lot of. Um, I would say there is fear, but it's sometimes you know with information, many times just with interaction that we can move forward. And and I think most individuals in this country actually do not like the status quo when it comes to uh, our immigration laws. In fact, want, want things to change. That's the majority of America. But I think that we have a very vocal um, minority and very organized um, uh, groups of uh, groups that actually promote 
this kind of division. So I, I just feel like it's not just <coughs> a natural situation as well. Yes, no, go ahead. Okay, uh, one last comment on, on that issue. Uh, what happened here is, uh, as you uh, mentioned it, is because of politics, because uh, the decisions are taking place uh, at Congress. And if you see uh, the, uh, at Congress, we as Latinos, we don't have that kind of representation. And it's not uh, because uh, uh, we don't deserve it. It's because we don't get organized. We don't get involved. Uh, we need to learn from each other. We need to learn from the people of color that they do have good representation. Uh, if not uh, good enough, they are working on it, but not the Latino community. Uh, we need to recognize that the, Cu uh, the Cubans have representation, but the Cubans, not the Mexicans, not the Salvatoran people. The Jews have really good representation, but not us as Latinos. So what happens here is that those few individuals at Congress are uh, deciding the fate of all the uh, Latino community. So, and, uh, and if you see the real uh, American people, the American people, the white people, they, they, most of them, they don't think like those at the Congress. The most the white people get to know a Latino immigrant, the most positive they think about the Latino community. But what we need is to have this congressman, congresswoman at Congress to sit with those uh, 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 at the majority of Congress, which is the, the white uh, community, so they can sit together to have a coffee to, to really talk about what's really going on. And I am sure that even the, those uh, congressmen, the, 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 the ones that have the majority, they eventually would understand uh, that America is a great nation because of the immigrants that are here. So I would say the message for the other question uh, before, the message, uh, the message for the young people is get involved. Get involved, get organized, promote civic participation. We told the people, uh, you, you really need to vote. You really need to bring the people to vote and send a message. So someone has to uh, speak for us where the decisions are taking place. I, I, I would say that. Next question. Thank you again, everyone, for being here. Um, it's been really informed and really insightful. Um, my question is... Well, that's your name? Ah, David Azevedo. I'm a junior political science major. And your favorite professor? Favorite professor? Dr. Guerra, I think, would have Thank to be you. my choice. <laughs> yeah. um, my question is kind of something that I feel really didn't get talked about a lot. I mean, we were talking about a little bit about this political catch-22 of immigration reform. Um, but there was no real talk about reform in education, criminal justice things that you see really affect the Latino, the growing Latino community. Um, when you look at uh, the um, population in, in jails and the laws that are being targeted towards Latino communities and the fact that Latinos that are coming or being born in the U.S. to parents who we were talking about earlier with your presentation about how they're growing up in households that um, encourage um, behaviors that are unhealthy, um, like in terms of joining a gang, uh, being targeted by the law um, for that and getting into the... So creating this culture, pretty much, that's going to be growing and growing as the population grows and grows, and so therefore needs to be treated, I think, more with education reform, with getting kids in this culture that are growing up in this culture into schools, into better schools, and getting educated, because it also seems to me that, in terms of you were talking a little bit about this, uh, Efrain, about how we need to organize. And I don't think you can really organize unless you have some form of education to become aware of how you can make changes. So what are your guys' thoughts in terms of maybe the, the energy and momentum we need to have with um, answering these questions that we're asking right now is an education reform, criminal justice reform? So are we creating a Latino underclass, especially when you take a look at the, the data that uh, Professor Hayes Bautista presented, the more Latinos are here, and the less they get, the, the more they get away from their immigrant families and backgrounds, they they have characteristics that are are not necessarily not necessarily good. D David, is is, is there going to be a Latino permanent underclass? No, because we've been looking. I'm looking at 150 years of now Latinos in California as part of the United States. There have been attempts to create one. And, but this always comes from external policy, just left on their own. Actually, if Latino parents are able to teach their kids, we're doing a lot of work on adolescent development. You know, the parents are telling the kid, get educated, get ahead, don't yeah, smoke, yeah, don't but drink. Yeah, but let's not, but let's, okay. Yeah. Uh, Latinos are overrepresented in prison. 
overrepresented in those that drop out of high school, overrepresented in a variety of different things that we consider socially bad. We, yeah, can't, we can't ignore I'll, those things. No, but we do need, do need to put them in context because we have to understand that figure we often hear that half of Latinos drop out of high school. Actually, if you look at the difference between the immigrant and the U.S. born, there's a huge difference. About 35% of immigrants did graduate from high school, and that's in their country of origin, whereas U.S. born, it's around about 80% do graduate from high school. Now, for other groups, it's 85 to 90, so there's still a gap, but it's not this 50% gap. Right. Uh, so, and likewise on prison, if you look at Latinos in prison, actually Latinos are the only population proportionately represented. Uh, the non-Hispanic white is underrepresented, African-American over actually Latinos are proportionally, kind of what you expect just through criminals out there. I mean, we got one area where we're proportionally represented. <laughs> All right. So, it's, so there are issues, but here's, and this ties into education, by the way. What we tend to forget, uh, what I'm often told by my friends in educational policies, the biggest single predictor of a child's educational success is the child's parents' educational level. Well, what's interesting, as we look at the baby boomers, and I guess a couple of us are of the baby boomer generation, what we tend to forget <clears throat> is that the baby boom generation, that was about 90% non-Hispanic white, the parents of the baby boomers were high school dropouts. But by public policy in the state of California, we made college graduates Be out clear, of the children of high school dropouts. Right, you're talking about whites now. Well, that's, it just so happened at that time, most of that young generation was non-Hispanic white. But it just so happened, okay? And we decided to invest. We created the public education infrastructure here in California so such that when I was a freshman back in 1963 at the University of California, and I wrote my first check to the regents for total fees, tuition, et cetera, it was $27, period. Now. And you took out a loan. <laughs> didn't have to. Just stole a couple of hubcaps and I made it. Uh, now, I don't need to tell you that in my entire entering class, there were two African Americans, about a half a dozen Asian, and as far as I could tell, I was the only Latino. So the, the benefits did not accrue to these other communities. Now, in the UC system, they've just jacked up the uh, tuition again, and I have a son at UC San Diego, and it's about, what, twelve or $13,000. Just now, as Latinos are a significant part of the graduating classes, we have really raised the tuition. We have piled all sorts of burdens onto education. We have cut things. Uh, and it just so happens now, as the baby boomers basically, by and large, didn't get married, don't have kids, they say, why should I spend money on education? I don't have kids. Well, these kids are going to be paying for the baby boomers' retirement. They're going to be funding Social Security, Medicare, if, they're thinking, if they have a private pension plan, if they're thinking of the real estate, will they require a younger generation that's very productive, uh, economically active? Ec uh, education is only going to do that in the future. We're going into the knowledge, globalized knowledge industry, and we're cutting that, and we're just slitting everyone's throat, not just Latino, everyone's throat to the extent that we do that. Let me get a couple more questions. Michael? Hello, I'm a Michael Farrell. I'm a sophomore political science major, and my question goes out to Mrs. Salas. And I was just wondering where you got your figure of $16 billion in the, to boost the economy from, and where and how you got that figure. And, and, and reframe what, what you were saying. Recontextualize that number. So what uh, we were talking about, what I was talking about um, was a report that was done by the University of Southern California. You know what, uh, Henrika, why don't you use this right here? So, um, so I was talking about a report that was done by the University of Southern California um, that we commissioned to basically answer the following question. What would happen if we were able to legalize the undocumented migrants who live in <coughs> California economically? What would be that contribution? So the way that that figure was derived was one, it first um, looked at what is the wage penalty. So right now, given all this demographic, the same demographic factors, the characteristics of an individual, their skill set, the industry that they're working in, um, what is the wage penalty for you being undocumented? And um, it's basically very significant. And so it looks first at what then is the loss of revenue that um, being undocumented has in terms of being able to consume and, and buy products and actually pay, pay taxes. So it discovers that. Then the so it, it's, it's a multiplier effect. Right. But then afterwards, it looked at um, the other thing that it did. It looked at um, uh, some work that had been done both on immigrants that actually were able to legalize during 1986. And um, there's a lot of work that had been done on that in, by, by different scholars. So it looks at that. 
And then it demonstrates, you know, well, what happens to the wage um, the, or the increase in, in wages by legalizing a particular population. And it looks only at Latinos. It doesn't look at the Asian community just because there wasn't enough of a sample. And what, come, and what um, happens is that when you look at uh, what happened for immigrants who legalized their status in the amnesty of 1986, there's a jump. And not only are they... Um, uh, produce, you know, certainly earning more. Um, they're also buying more. They're also paying more taxes. And so then using a lot of that information, we look at what the populate, you know, uh, what that would do for the population now. And so that's how you get those $16 billion. Um, you, the University uh, you, um, of UCLA actually did another study. It looked at the numbers at a national level. And what they um, estimate, uh, Professor Raul Enijosa says $1.5 trillion uh, in a boost to the economy. Um, he's, uh, he actually adds also what would, what would be the, um, the contribution of new migrants who would be coming in uh, with legal status as opposed to undocumented. All this to say um, is that uh, it's not just um, the undocumented migrants who are losing out economically, we're all losing out. And, it, and it's not, you know, immigrants do contribute taxes. They contribute, most of undocumented migrants actually um, are um, working with false documents. Not, you know, a lot of people believe it's just cash under the table. Most are falsely documented. And so what happens is that they pay um, taxes to all local, state, national taxes. What, but what happens is that they don't get it back. They can't claim it back like, every year on their income taxes. So that's, so there is contribution already, but this would actually increase the contribution. Um, and so I, I would, maybe later on we could talk a little bit about more about where we're on with immigration reform and some of these things. It okay. also costs the government a lot of money to process, you know, uh, taxes with the false documents, you know. Right. Well, yeah. and and I would just also say that um, we've been talking to uh, Jana Napolitano, who's actually uh, been put, um, put put as lead by President Barack Obama on immigration reform, and they've already made the numbers. It's certainly, it is cheaper for this country to legalize um, the 12 million undocumented migrants who are here um, than to actually deport them all. And so um, they're clear that at the end of the day, at least what they're saying is, we, we need to push immigration reform um, because this is, um, this is a way by which to also save the, um, the government money. And Janet Napolitano is the former governor of Arizona and now the Secretary of Homeland Security. Is that yes, that's her title? Valerie? Hi, I'm Valerie. I'm a senior political science major. And my question is referring to something that Dr. Estrada talked about, how Washington is no longer uh, making a difference or distinction distinction between um, illegal and legal immigrants. And I was wondering, um, do you think that this causes um, tensions to arise between immigrants and later generation immigrant um, communities because they are seen as foreign due to the immigrants that are coming here? Leo? Well, there's always been tension between the later comers and the newcomers in all groups. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. People who got to Los Angeles 50 years ago don't like anybody who arrived the last 10 years. And, and it happens. Uh, Whether you're Latino, black, <laughs> Latino Asian or, or yeah. not. You're, but the point is that uh, <clears throat> there's always been some tensions between the legal immigrants and the undocumented, but mostly because the legals hate to be confounded with the others. So they, they, they see the group as sort of putting a stigmatism on them that they don't deserve. What's happening in Washington, but people did make the distinction, we're not undocumented, we're, we're legal. Washington's not making that distinction anymore. That's what's important. And if they don't make it, then somewhere down the line, the public won't make it either. And that's a real problem. Okay. And introduce uh, yourself. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mickey Weinstein. I'm a junior political science major. Um, I'd just like to ask briefly, what is this uh, distinction between undocumented, illegal, and the term, uh, quote unquote, ambiguous status, like the guest worker, uh, Bracero program. What is what is the distinction between all of those terms? Angelica. <laughs> so, um, undocumented is with without status. So you you're not legally um, able to work in this country, and, and literally you don't necessarily have an identity in this country. So legal status. Um, legal legal status comes in many forms. So you can be legally in this country, and you could be a refugee, an asylee. Or you can also um, have legal permanent resident, which basically means that you've, you're given the opportunity to both live and work here. 
Um, and then there's naturalized. Uh, so you're an immigrant who is a naturalized citizen. So the way you become a citizen in this country is after um, you have legal permanent residence for five years, uh, in some cases for three years, then you can apply to become a citizen of the United States by passing, um, uh, uh, by passing a test and basically um, giving an, a, an oath of allegiance to the country. I think the way to make it, as, the way that I make it as easy as possible in terms of how do you legalize, legalize your status in this country, it's um, blood, sweat, and tears. Blood. Do you have a relative who is a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident that can actually bring you into this country? I say sweat because there are some visas that are available um, for work, but most of those work visas are for highly skilled workers, mostly in technology and other um, highly skilled industries, very low skilled workers. I think there was like 5,000 visas that were given last year. And then when we say tears, um, we mean um, people who are fleeing their home country because of um, uh, political, religious, or other persecution. And so uh, refugees are given status outside of the United States, and asylees um, have to prove the same thing as refugees, but, once, but they get asylum because they arrive usually without status in this country, and they have to prove um, that, if they had, um, that they are suffering from persecution, and if they were to be deported back to their home country, they would be um, taken back. Last thing on the legal piece, so you guys have heard everything that's been going on with Haiti in terms of the earthquake. Um, there is a temporary protected status, which is legal in the country. You can work in the country, you just can't travel a home. Um, but so those, I hope that's uh, the explanation about our, or the way our system, our immigration system works. And could I add in one thing on that, by, on the undocumented status, by the way? Up until 1926, all immigrants were undocumented because we never asked for any documents. So anyone whose ancestors came here before 1926, guess what? Your great grandparents were undocumented. We didn't ask for it. You didn't need documents to come here. We started that in 1926. And actually, the so-called undocumented do have documents. We choose not to recognize them, but they have documents. Okay, um, two, two less. One more for Dr. Estrada. I have one time for one more question about no, the census. but okay. <laughs> well, I'll ask, I can ask him after. Okay, yeah, why don't, you, why don't we do that? Because uh, we're running out of time and I, I have a question. Um, so, uh, two, two, two more questions. One question for the academics and then a different question for the uh, activist organizers. To Professor uh, Hayes Bautista, Professor Estrada, and Professor Kim, um, Los Angeles has changed drastically in terms of its people. Um, what will LA look like in 20 years? Increasingly, LA in 20 years will look like LA did on September 6, 1781, the day it was founded. There were 44 pobladores. Of those 44 pobladores, about 25% were of African origin. About another 25% were of Indian origin. Another 25%, or actually more about 35%, were mestizos. They're kind of a mixture of African, Indian, and European. Two of them, okay, 4%, were European. And there would have been an Asian, a Filipino, but he had been exposed to smallpox and was uh, quarantined at the mission of San Gabriel, didn't come down here for a month after. So actually the same proportions will be in about 20 years, the way LA looked like. We've just come full circle, just took us 250 years. <laughs> Pastor Kim? Um, ditto. <laughs> I definitely think those trends are gonna happen. Um, um, a much larger Latino population, a much larger um, of color population. Um, what I also think is going to happen, I was mentioning earlier ethnic differentiation. I think you're going to see even more, um, you know, ethnic groups, sub-ethnic groups, um, and different language, culture, um, all that. But I also, in the Asian American community, what's interesting is there's also more class differentiation. So um, one of the reasons why the whole model minority stereotype came to be was because um, the Asian Americans that came starting in the, the, the mid-60s, 70s, they tended to be um, middle class or of higher status, um, in part because the, the way immigration laws in the United States were designed was they favored people um, um, you know, of higher class status. And so what's been interesting is that in, you know, in the recent decade um, or more, um, scholars are saying that there's actually more working class um, immigrants coming in um, to the United States. 
from various Asian countries. And of course, um, you know, Southeast Asian immigrants came in as refugees, you know, as um, we were talking about earlier, um, the Vietnam War, the war in Cambodia and Laos and so on. Um, and so, you know, you're seeing all kinds of class differentiation that way. Um, What's also interesting is in addition to sort of, you know, more working class immigrants coming in from these Asian countries, you're also seeing really rich, the, the very rich um, Asian immigrants coming in from the countries that have become like these Asian tigers, right? Their economies have, have um, boomed and um, they're coming in and they're, they're you know, um, buying big houses or trying to buy lots of property or you'll see, you know, the big um, countries like Japan and Korea, you know, they're buying all kinds of real estate and things like that. And, you know, I think what's interesting about that, and this kind of relates to the previous question about tensions, is there can be tensions because there's, you know, the poorer immigrants coming in, but there's also tensions because, you know, the richer immigrants might come in and be too threatening, right? Um, take over too much or look like they're taking over too much. And it's exactly, you know, this threat, the, the idea that you're gonna become this racial immigrant foreign threat, you know, that partly fueled, you know, um, what, um, Professor Hayes Bautista was saying and everybody else, you know, oh my gosh, they're gonna take over, let's, you know, tax them, let's exclude them from the country, um, let's deport them. And so I think there are these interesting dynamics going on that, that don't just hit a single note. Dr. Estrada? Yeah, <clears throat> actually the answer has already been given by, the, by Dr. Kim and uh, Hayes Bautista, so I'm gonna answer it differently. LA is gonna look like your high school. Um, you're gonna arrive, you think about high school, you arrive and you divide up into groups. African Americans go in one group, white kids over here, Asians over there. Everybody goes in the playground before school starts into their own little groups. And some people can cross around, like athletes can you know, go you know, together. Uh, people in student government can go back and forth between groups. But basically people start off by sitting up in their groups. The bell rings, you go into class, you, know, you sit together with people that are very different. The teacher says, you know, you're going to do an assignment and you get up and, and you work together with people that are different than you and you accomplish an assignment and then the bell rings, the period's over and everybody goes back to their group. That's what LA is going to be like in the way I see it. And just substitute where you live and where you work and it's for the school and that's what I think it will be like. We're going to live in ethnic enclaves and clusters. We're going to work together. We're going to do good things but at the end of the day, we're going to back to go back to our groups. You know, we've ru run out of time, but I did want Angelica to talk about what's going to happen on, on Saturday to kind of to show uh, what, because my question was going to be, what do you guys do as organizers? What's your mil major challenge in organizing? What are some of the activities that you undertake? Why don't we just talk about this and we'll end with that. Okay. So, um as in, so first of all, um, next, uh, Saturday, uh, February uh, tw uh, 20th, we're actually having a forum on immigration reform. It's a town hall with uh, Congressman Javier Becerra, Vice Chair of the Democratic Caucus, um, and with some representation from our Senator Boxer. Um, we're still waiting on that. And what it is is to discuss immigration reform. I have lots of flyers. Um, it's gonna be at SEIU ULTC in LA, and uh, it's gonna be at eight, from 8.30 to 11. You can also go to our website, www.chirla.org. But the thing I wanna leave you with is um, we're fighting for immigration reform, and one of the ways that we've actually engaged in this fight is th through the use of technology. And we have close to 100,000 people who are part of this campaign who are, um, have sent over 600,000 calls, um, faxes, and emails to their members of Congress. And they've done it through um, this new mechanism, which is it's not very new to you guys, which is to text uh, justice to 69866. And I have a bunch of stuff, so you, if you guys, um, you can distribute it. Again, it's uh, text justice to 69866. Six. And what you'll do is you'll get alerts um, about um, what's happening with the Reform Immigration for America campaign. And, but most importantly is it'll connect you directly to your member of Congress, who you should know, and your senator, who you should know. Um, and especially as, um, as there's movement, it's so important for those of you who are in support of immigration reform to speak up, and we really need you. Um, and um, have other information that um, please come up and uh, if you're interested um, to get. Thank you so much. Uh, let's give a warm Loyola Marymount University thank you. Thank you. See you guys next week. Don't forget to uh, sign your sheet for those of you who are in class.